Golf one and done leagues are exploding in popularity and for good reason. They're very simple. You're not eliminated at any point like you are in an NFL survivor league. Also, they can be as complex as you want. And now with the growth in the industry, there's actually a lot of big money to be won in these one and done contests. So I'm going to run you through the math behind some strategy to try to give you a leg up. And I'll show you a couple of different leagues that you can get into if you do want to compete for money or for glory in a global league. We'll talk through all of that, but let's jump into it. Golf's one and done in 2024. All right, Rick Gaiman here, and I've been talking a lot about these one and done contests over the years, so I, I won't give you the full on just basic primer here, but if you've never heard of this, what you're asked to do is select one golfer each week. You get as much uh, money in points as they do on the golf course, and whoever has the most money at the end wins and can win a lot of money. So um, let me take you through this a little bit quickly here, because I think there are a couple of items that you need to keep in mind as you're investing into these contests. Size absolutely matters. And that relates to two things. It relates to the size of the contest that you are in, and it relates to the size of the purse. So if you have not been following the PGA Tour, the world of golf uh, recently, the, the purses are out of control and the way that they are spreading them out is nowhere near even. So what we're getting is these peaks and valleys of prize purses. So that's what I'm showing you on the screen right now. And most one and done leagues will, will have 31 events. It'll be from the Sony open until the BMW championship. Yes. Some might start the tournament champions. Yes. Some might go until the tour championship, but this is the standard uh, schedule. It's the schedule that I use in both of the one and dones that I run and most people around the industry use as well. And you can see there is a huge discrepancy between the purses, anywhere from $8 million, $7.7 .7 million up to $25 million. And actually the most annoying part about this right now is as we turn the calendar into 2024, the PGA tour has not even announced their official prize purses Yet we know which events are the signature events. So those are going to get $20 million purses almost certainly. And then we know obviously the major championships and where they are going to come in. And we kind of have past history to show you where the non-signature events might come in. So that's what I've put together here in the spreadsheet, just what I think the most likely purses are, the ones that we know, and what the first place prizes are. And what you're going to see is you're going to see, again, these, these peaks and valleys. And there used to be a time in one and done where everybody went out and spent their four best golfers at the major championships because they were the biggest purses. And then the players championship got cranked up to 20 million or $25 million. And then you realize that was the most valuable tournament. Well, now with the combination of majors and signature events, there are actually 14 different events that can get you a huge chunk of money, nearly half the schedule. So that's good. That opens up a lot more combinations, a lot more permutations. You don't just have to play your four best players at major championships. In fact, you probably shouldn't. You should probably play your four best golfers at the players championship and three of the signature events. That would actually be the way to do it if you were trying to maximize the most EV, the most expected value. Put a pin in that thought for a second. The other thing that matters is how many people are in your league. I have participated in a huge range of different size leagues, as small as, I mean, I was in one last year that I think had 14 people in it. I was in one last year that had 5,000 people in it. So what I did is I ran the numbers and I grabbed a couple of different contests that I was in to kind of show you how much money you are going to need to win that contest, not to, you know, just cash or whatever, but to actually win it. So in a 50 person league, you probably need about $22 million in earnings throughout the year to win it. That's $709,000 per start in a 500 person tournament. You probably need closer to 25 million, which is about $806,000 per start. When you get to a thousand people, uh, it's closer to 27 million. That's about $870,000 per start. And then when you get to 4,000, 5,000, you're talking about $29 million, maybe even $30 million um, to win those leagues, which is about $935,000 per start. And the reason that I point that out is because when you start looking at the first place purses, 
compared to how much you will need to win over the course of a season uh, in each of these different size leagues, there's a ton of opportunity, right? So those 14 events that I mentioned earlier, those 14 events, nearly half the schedule will give you about if you win it, if you get, if you pick the winner, about 15 or 16% of the money that you need over the course of the entire season in one go. So let's game that out a little bit, right? If you pick the winner of the AT&T Pebble Beach Pro-Am this year and you get the 3.6 million, that is about 16% of the, the money that you will need over the course of the entire season to win a 50-person league. So you picked up one-sixth of the amount of money that you need in one event with 30 others still to add to your total. Okay. And that's important. So you can see how, um, you know, and obviously it depends on like, if everybody picks the winner at one of these events, you might need a little bit more. If you were the only person, like, obviously there's a lot of other var variables here, but the fact that half the schedule is full of these events is really exciting for, for our purposes. And you can see, you know, these events that only offer 1.3, 1.4, uh, $1.5 million. They, even if you find the winner, they are not getting you a significant chunk of the money that you need to win. So we're going to focus on these big events. They're going to be the ones that we're going to roll out our best options. They're the ones that we are going to roll out um, the game theory options as well. We're going to try to get a little bit different from everybody else, but there's a lot of opportunity to do that this year, which should um, help alleviate a little bit of the luck aspect as well. I've actually found I've been more successful now that the tour has gone to a signature event type of schedule where there are more of the, you want to make more decisions. It used to just be if you got the majors right you would be towards the top. Now there's more of those uh, uh, high leverage decisions to be made. If you want to get into one of these leagues, I'm running two different leagues for kind of two different purposes. The first one is rungoodgolf.com. It is me on my site hosting um, just full on stat tracking, full on anything that you can imagine, essentially a global one and done ranking system. So if you've ever played in my one and dones before, I already have your data loaded in. I already have a profile made for you. You can click through your past stats. You can earn badges. It's a lot of fun. It's cheap to get in. It's only 39 bucks. And this is open to everyone globally, which is one of the issues that we've had in the past. So you can go Get your stat page, uh, compete in divisions. There is promotion and relegation. So if you are in the top percent of your division, you get promoted for next year. Or if you're in the bottom, you get relegated. So it's just going to be a lot of fun. It's cheap. There's small prizes, but I've got to be conscientious about the uh, legalities and, and regulations worldwide, but that is open to everyone. So come and join that. At last check, there was about 650 people in that. So we're going to have at least 10 full divisions, probably much more than that by the time that we get to the Sony Open when this uh, starts on the 11th of January, I believe is the date of the Sony Open. And then the other one is on Splash Sports. So Splash is what we've used for um, our weekly contests. It is what we have used for our NFL Survival survivor pool. And this one is, is, is like, go get the bag, right? This is for money. Currently the first prize, uh, if we can fill this thing is going to be $30,000. Imagine that 30 K for winning a, a one and done. So, um, you can enter up to three times. There's it's $150 entry. This is completely regulated, all good on the up and up, but it's only available in 41 states. So unfortunately for those of you who are in the nine states that this is not available for those of you in Canada and worldwide, my apologies. Uh, it stinks. I get it. That's why I wanted to have an option for both. And honestly, if you want to, uh, participate in both, please do. You should, I will. And the links and information for both of those will be in the description. If you want to get involved, there are a couple of little tricks about picking golfers, but, uh, before I jump into that and show you a little bit of data, pick your golfers, right? The amount of people who leave Rory McIlroy and John Rahm and Scotty Scheffler and Xander Shoffley and Max Homa on the bench at the end of the year is, is jarring. You have, you have cost yourself a ton of expected value. Be Santa Claus, make a list, check it twice. I don't care if you make a list from the official world golf rankings, top 40. I don't care if you make a list from the FedEx cup, top 40 or whatever, make a list 
print it out on your desk and make sure that you are using at least all of the top guys uh, by the time that we get to the end of the year. Okay, let me show you. So I've been um, combing over the data from past selections, from past contests, and you're going to see a really interesting way in which some of these golfers are used. Okay, so this is all of uh, the data from last year. And you can see, I mean, uh, look at the number of people that drop off on even making their selections at the end of the year. Don't do that. Make your picks through throughout the year. But um, what I want to show you is, you know, there there is a huge kind of group think or there is a huge... I don't even know what the word is, like like deployment of these golfers. So let me show you something interesting. Let's look up Jordan Spieth. Very popular golfer. He's going to be used by most people in, in, in one and done situations. He is used almost exclusively at three events throughout the year. Um, 15% of people use him at the Pebble Beach program. That will probably be higher this year because that is a signature event. 16.5% of people used him at the Masters. And then 15% of people used him at the Charles Schwab, an event that uh, is in Texas, which, which makes a lot of sense. These are places that he plays very, very well. So the idea being that if you can hold on to Jordan Spieth, at least through the Masters, at least through the Masters, there is about half of the league that does not even have access to him anymore. Okay. So we're going to talk about that in a second. The, the idea of not only ownership, how many people are selecting each golfer on a weekly basis, but also the available to use rate, right? If, if half the league cannot even use Jordan Spieth, uh, you have, you have carved out a little bit of, of an edge. If you go to use him at a specific spot and is Jordan Spieth significantly more likely to win the Charles Schwab than the PGA championship, the Charles Schwab, than the Wells Fargo, than the RBC heritage, whatever the answer in short is, is no. A lot of these guys, even the best players, even the favorites are going to be maybe nine or 10% likely to win a golf tournament, maybe. And the difference between Jordan Spieth at one of a variety of different events is maybe 1% or maybe 2%, but people get really caught up in places to use him. Let me show you another one, Rory McIlroy. Again, if you can wait on Rory McIlroy, you are going to be much better off. Look at this chart from last year. He was used 12, 36, he was used by nearly half the entire league by the, by the players championship last year. We did not even get to the first major and Rory McElroy had been used by half the league. Then when you add in the masters and the Wells Fargo championship, that's another 25%. So basically Rory McIlroy was used in 75% of the, by 75% of the league, by the time we got to the second major. Um, I don't need to remind you that Rory finished runner up at the U S open. I don't need to remind you that he just, I mean, he had a phenomenal year. He made a ton of money just being able to use him and look at his final, you know, seven or eight events. He was not used in any single week, more than six and a half percent. And you could have had like a 1% Rory McElroy in half of his starts. So we're going to try to wait on Rory. Right. And, and there's some of these guys like this. You'll look at Scotty. Actually, Scotty's fairly well-rounded, right? Scotty got used uh, early in the year, but he got used kind of everywhere. Some people saved him for the U S open there. There's, you know, there's not a ton of, of trends here. Scotty was a, was a great pick, um, all year long. Here's Max Homa's chart, 19% at the farmers, 20% at the Genesis. By the time we got to the first major championship, he was used in 40, 50, about 60% of leagues. Can we wait on Max Homa? These are guys that you can wait on, rolling out the opportunity for anybody else to use them. What about the opposite? Is there someone that we should use early? Someone like Hideki, I think is interesting, right? When you look at Hideki, he is either used uh, early at the Sony Open or late in the season. There is kind of a dead period for Hideki from the Farmers Insurance Open until you know, maybe even the Memorial where he's had a good record, maybe the Byron Nelson, but you could get him at one or 2% ownership, basically any of the first couple of months of the year. And even if you want to run it back out at the masters, 2.6% owned at last year's masters, right? So, um, Hideki does have 
places with good history on the schedule, Phoenix as well, uh, where he's going to be low owned and using him, not Sony, but early would make you different. Let me show you a couple more here. Um, Keegan Bradley was generally used later. Yes, he was used a bit at the Sony Open. Yes, he was used, believe it or not, the Players' Championship quite a bit, at least of, of, of his selections, excuse me. Um, but the uh, Rocket Mortgage and the BMW Championship were larger portions of his ownership. And then I'll wrap this up with Cantlay and Xander Shoffley. You can use that can't uh, you can see that Cantlay is usually one of the most spread out golfers uh, from the beginning of the year straight up until basically you get to the U.S. Open. He is he's fairly popular in a lot of these different uh, different tournaments. And then Xander has kind of a, a an interesting little bell curve where the majority of his use is in the summertime. The Wells Fargo Championship through the Travelers Championship is where he is going to gobble up a lot of his projected owners you know, using him at um, the Open Championship or using him prior to that. Maybe it's the Players Championship. Maybe it's an event in March. S seems to be a way to differentiate yourself. And and I want to go back to the idea of, of why it's important to differentiate yourself, why it's important to know the odds on these guys are really, really close, allowing leverage and luck to kind of fall in your favor. Um is probably the best way to do this. I tried to illustrate an example that might be helpful here. So I, I just, obviously I just made up these numbers, but let's say that you are, you know, at you're past the halfway point. You've got uh, two options for a specific week. One is Rory McIlroy. One is Scotty Scheffler. The assumptions that we are making is that Rory's implied odds to win the golf tournament is about 12 and a half percent. And Scotty's is about 9.9%, a little under 10%. In the odds market, that's a pretty big difference at the top. In terms of actual percentage, it's it's what two two and a half percent. It is not really a big deal at all. What what is come? What is more important is how many golfers uh, or how many users have each of those available. So let's say Rory McIlroy, like we have seen, is only available to fifty percent of the users. But Scotty Scheffler, he has already been used quite a bit. He's available to twenty percent. Only twenty percent of users. We're going to assume that each of the groups that have these golfers available, half of them are going to use them. That means that Rory McIlroy gets used uh, by 25% of the total users and Scotty Scheffler gets used by 10% of the entire, um, of the entire league. The first place win equity, uh, money for Rory McIlroy a $3.6 million purse uh, times 12 and a half percent is 450,000. That's what he would you know, expect to receive. Scotty Scheffler would expect to receive 359,000. Uh, and then in raw numbers, if this was a thousand person league, 125 would use Rory McElroy and 20 would use Scotty Scheffler. Okay. I just threw a lot of numbers at you, but what that essentially shows the difference between the odds to win and the expected value of money earned is not nearly as large as the amount of people who end up using a golfer, right? So the difference between Scotty Scheffler and Rory McIlroy uh, in money, expected money is less than $100,000. It is a multiple of 1.25 uh, from Rory to Scotty. But the multiple of people that are using him, Rory to Scotty, is 6.25. So what with golf and how very how much variance there is, how much crazy stuff can happen, giving yourself a golfer at one sixth of the ownership that is only a few percentage points worse in the outright market is going to be more valuable every single time you might run bad and the chalk might go out and win all these signature events. But the times that Scotty comes through the times that the, that low owned or guy that is not even available to be owned comes through. That's what vaults you up. That is what gives you the chunk of money that you need to actually win these types of contests, that's how you separate yourself from the rest of the field. And the truth is, 
you know, Scotty Scheffler, um, or I actually just looked it up, you know, Max Homa, who we saw is, you know, used significantly at the beginning of the year before we get to any major championships has the same odds, 35 to one to win each of the four major championships. And I know it's early, it's obviously early in the year, but there is not going to be enough that changes week in and week out. Um, to make these guys any significantly better or significantly worse in the in the odds market, which is I think something that we should be looking at and taking very seriously. The the final thing to consider is the idea of future value. We looked at this a lot in the NFL Survivor pool that we did because that's a lot easier to calculate future value. You know what the games are already going to be. You know that every team of the NFL is going to play seventeen games. We don't know this far in advance, what events these golfers are going to play, but we can make some assumptions, right? So if you're Rory McIlroy and we assume that he is going to play all of the major championships, that he is going to play all of the signature events, and he might not, right? He might take one or two off. They're, I guess, probably still trying to figure out the rules of that. He's going to play the final two events. You've got, um, you know, 14 events for Rory for a total of, uh, what is that? $277 million in, in prize money. He is not going to be significantly more likely to win the AT&T Pebble Beach Pro-Am uh, as he would be to win the Travelers Championship, for example. Um, and they have the same purses. One, Rory McIlroy will be at a much lower availability number simply because more tournaments would have passed and holding on to him probably becomes more valuable. Now there's going to be guys that are the opposite. There are going to be guys that peak early in the year. Maybe that is Hideki, you know, cause those the, the good spots for him are early. Maybe it is Max Homa. Maybe their future value does fall as the year goes on. So it's harder to make a calculation for that. Um, as we go through this week after week, I will try to, uh, I'll try to do that. I'll try to post some like future value numbers once the fields are are set and maybe an idea of 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 where these guys are going to play in the future. But that that to me, future value and ownership each week is probably the most important thing to consider for this year. If you do want to get involved, again, there are two different types of contests. If you want to win the bag and try to get your crack at uh, thirty thousand dollars for first place, if we can fill this thing. Go to Splash Sports. The link is in the description. Go enter your three entries. If you want to be part of something fun with a bunch of stat tracking that is open globally, that's Run Good Golf. That's my website. Or go ahead and do like me. Do like a lot of people I've seen and get in both. Uh, it's going to be an absolutely fun year. Plenty more one and done content coming. Best of luck and I'll talk to you guys soon.